Hey, everyone, and welcome back to this episode. Lots going on this week again, so we're going to dive right into it. In this week's episode, we are going to cover that term that you may have heard, extend and pretend. Is this the right thing and the right approach when it comes to lengthening amortizations? We'll give you some thoughts and opinions on that, as well as the recent Fed budget has come out. Obviously, we want to touch on some of the key points there. And when we're, and uh, in keeping in line with the Fed here, we're also going to dissect their recent backtracking on the foreign buyers ban that only came into effect less than three months ago. On top of that, Canada's GDP announcement just came out and I think surprised quite a few. We're going to divulge those numbers. And then lastly, talk about what is happening with home prices here in March, especially the detached numbers. They are actually quite shocking. And we're going to unveil all of that. Now, when it comes to home prices, obviously we're off the peak. Now we're heading back up. You're BC assessment probably says something else. If you're actually a homeowner and curious about the true market value of your property, feel free to reach out to us at any of that contact information below. We'd love to have a talk, even if you're not considering selling, but just want to know what type of market value your property is today. We're happy to help there. Okay, so number one off the top, extend and pretend. I'm hearing this statement a lot lately, and it's in reference to what's happening with people with variable rate mortgages who have seen their amortizations extend and extend, and sometimes, and for many of them, over 50 years now in, in the current amortization uh, space. So are they just pretending that when that term comes up that uh, everything's just going to be all right, and if they just don't think about it right now, that maybe things will work out. Well, when we're talking about your home and your payments, this is not an area for anybody to be pretending what's going on. And, th and there's very defined actions and options and dollar figures that are in place now so that you can actually take proper action. And I just want to dive into this a bit today because I think it's really important. So first, let's backtrack and talk about how extend and, and, and pretend is just the most recent sort of buzz term. And we see buzz terms all the time, especially from people who are of the belief that maybe the Vancouver market is going to collapse. There was the foreign buyer tax that was going to ruin the market. And then the stress test was going to cause everything to deflate. Uh, and then it was COVID. And then do you remember the mortgage deferral cliff? That was a super hot buzzword. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was a hot one. <laughs> and what was the outcome? The exact opposite. We're sitting at all-time oh, record low in arrears rates. Um, then it was rising interest rates. That's what was going to kill housing. And all, all of those were thought to completely cripple or destroy the market. Now, again, I'm not trying to be cruel here. Obviously, all those things or any number of those hurt some people financially. There's no question about that. The reality is those are largely the outliers and not the majority of people. So again, extend and pretend. Here's my thoughts. When it comes to, let's say, the banking side of this first, obviously nobody at the bank is, is doing any pretending. Every decision they make is calculated and concise. And the exact example here, that amortizations have extended up to 50 years, is a case in point. And, and what I mean by that is that the banks were obviously already prepared for a situation like we're in today where interest rates rose at very rapid rates. They didn't have to all run to OSFI and say, what do we do now? It's like, oh, well, okay, here's the contract. This has already been decided. Everybody keeps their house, keeps their payment. We're just extending amortizations. And yes, quote unquote, we'll deal with it later. But that obviously is in the print as well as to what dealing with it later looks like. And again, for borrowers, if borrowers are the one pretending, maybe get the, the head out of the sand because again, this is your house. This is not something you want to pretend you might be okay in the future when you can be proactive and financially prudent today and just take some simple action. So I want to kind of carefully outline what the pretend part of the situation can look like because there's a very real outcome. And uh, this is just kind of to help people understand what that is, as well as to, again, properly prepare for it. So today, about one third of banks, the big banks mortgage book is variable, 30, 33%. It's a large number. As we know, since March of last year, interest rates have increased 425 basis points, tremendously, tremendously fast and the fastest in recent history. This has resulted in essentially every variable rate mortgage hitting what is called their trigger rate. Um, two banks, National and Scotia, those are the two banks that have adjustable rate variable mortgages. That means people with uh, variable rate mortgages with either of those banks have seen their payments increase over uh, that time. Their amortizations are not extending, but their payments are increasing. Uh, some hopefully people have been able to make those payments. If not, I'm sure they've talked to their bank and, and figured out other options or been forced to sell. 
Okay, those are the realities. The rest of the banks, on the other hand, um, have obviously fixed rate, sorry, fixed payment variable rate mortgages, meaning their payments are the same today as they were when uh, rates were, were much, much lower. And although the trigger rates have hit, that means that when they started their payments, maybe up to a third of their payment was going towards interest, whereas now it's all the way up to 100%. And once it, once it hit trigger rate and went beyond that, then of course the amortization, the length that they owe on the term of their uh, total mortgage is extending. That happened around summer, around August of last year. The reality is, is that most of these variable rate mortgages now have amortizations in excess of 50 years. Now that rates have stopped increasing, at least for the time being, that amortization period is basically the same, uh, but every month you got to think they are not covering the entire amount of their payment to even cover the interest. So what's happening? Well, that interest is adding to the balance of their total owing. This is where it is important to know the term trigger point. We've talked about trigger rate a lot, but trigger point is now going to be the reality for a few, potentially a few people here. So a trigger point is where those excess amount that you're not paying towards the total interest actually owed each month and is adding to your total balance. Once that hits 105% of the original mortgage balance or original amount that was borrowed, that is when you hit your trigger point. So if you borrowed a million dollars a year ago, you paid some down, now your payments are high and you're still making your payments, but there's money added every single month. If that million dollar original mortgage hits $1 million and $50, you are definitely getting a call from the bank. And that is the time where you have to do something. One, one million have to do something. Thousand, right? Sorry? You said $1,050,000. I mean, $1,050,000. I thousand. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Good Appreciate that. Big swing there. <laughs> There's a lot of numbers I'm throwing out. I, this is why Ryan yeah. and I are partners, so he can <laughs> catch me when I make my mistakes. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, so 5%. Original mortgage was a million. And if, uh, it gets to the point where it's one million and fifty thousand dollars. Then yes, that is trigger point. The bank calls you, and you have to do one of three things, which I'm going to get into in a moment. So again, there's no pretending here. Okay, it's time to be proactive and prudent. So I want to share an exact worst case scenario. So please stick with me through this. I know it's a lot to take in, but it's 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 quite important. Uh, this is an actual real case here, and it essentially is worst case to give you an example of what the extreme outliers could face in this situation. April of 2022, this is one month into the rate hikes, somebody picked up a variable rate mortgage at 18, sorry, $818,000. At that time, they had a 1.64 variable rate. Today, that same rate is at 5.89%. Their original, or sorry, their payments are $2,875 per month. That payment is the same today as it was back in April, 2022. But the reality is because rates are up as high as they are, the actual interest payment should be $3,854. So they're actually, their entire payment is going towards interest and they still owe another $1,000 every month. That $1,000 is getting tacked on to their original balance. They're currently in a 50 plus year amortization. And of course, as I mentioned, that amortization isn't gonna extend based on rates staying the same. If rates go down, amortization will shrink. So when, in this exact worst case scenario, will they hit that trigger point of 105%? It will take at this rate today, again, if, if hypothetically rates don't change, they don't go up, they don't go down, they stay where they are today. Status quo, it will take four years to hit that trigger point. That means April of 2026. So that gives this person four years to do something. What are they gonna do to make this work? If they were to do nothing, if they were to quote unquote pretend and, and things don't, excuse me, pretend things will get better and they don't, this is what their three options would be. They would have to make a lump sum. This is when the bank calls them and says, you have to do something on April, 2026. They could make a lump sum payment to catch up to the tune of $150,000. If they didn't have that, they could increase their payment. Okay, keep in mind, the original payment was 2875. They would have to increase their payment to $5,431. The reality is there though, is that they that's at year four of their term. This is a five year term. So that payment would be for the one year. And then at year five, they would obviously have to renew and there might be a whole new number there for them to look at. 
option three is that they can then convert that same day in April of 2026 to a fixed term loan, a fixed term mortgage, wherein their payments would be $4,980. Now, and the reason that's lower than the other option is because today fixed rates are currently lower than variable rates, which is very uncommon, but that's the reality of where we are. So if they couldn't come up with the money, their best, uh, best chance to keep the home was to have a 73% increase in their monthly payment. Not all exciting options, understandably, but again, this is the reality. So don't pretend, let's look at the real numbers here. So these people in this worst case scenario should obviously consider making lump sums today, increasing their payments today, or moving to fixed today. Don't wait until four years. Now let's keep in mind here, any rate reductions today will basically mean that nobody will hit their trigger point. That, that worst case that hits it in four years, the vast majority of, of uh, mortgage holders today in variable are not going to be worst case scenario. And again, any rate reductions, even a quarter point over the next four years looks today that nobody will hit that trigger point. So while they will still be having extended AMs, they'll still have a renewal to worry about that type of thing. Nobody's going to hit their trigger point. That's the reality. But hey, we can't tell the future, but this is to help prepare people for a number of scenarios moving forward. So after, you know, after this extend and pretend probably will amount to nothing, though I could be totally wrong, time will tell, um, there's going to be the next buzzword. And that'll likely be, I guess, when, um, when people's mortgages are up for renewal, you know, off of basing it from when they bought them at very low rates, three, four years from now. Either way, don't pretend, prepare, increase payments, be financially prudent, and uh, it's important. So look, if you're in a, a, a similar position to this, just give your lender or bank a call and just prepare for the future. Having gone through a, a ton of numbers in the last one, I'm sorry, but we're not done yet. We've got a lot of numbers to get through in this one. Uh, we're going to talk about the federal budget right now because it's very important. Again, uh, I'm not really excited about the federal budget right now. I don't know how it balances uh, really anything to do with our inflation. Um, and I, I think I'll touch, on, I'll touch on that a little bit here, probably more about inflation in the GDP numbers. But anyhow, let's review this. So the federal deficit, if you can believe this, for 23, 24, 2023, 2024, is projected to be $40.1 billion. That's nearly $10 billion more that was in the forecast just last fall. Right. So the slowing economy and new liberal spendings are really behind this increase, uh, which kind of blows my mind, considering everything we're going through, uh, that they would consider spending so much more money. Uh, with that being said, uh, the budget outlines how the liberals plan to spend nearly $70 billion more between now and 2027, 2028, with 59.5 billion rolling out over the next five years. Their plan is to offset this with 25 billion in cuts and savings. Uh, the vast majority of spending though is in healthcare, uh, dental care and clean energy. Uh, however, having reading through, uh, having read through, sorry, the, uh, the notes in, in the budget meeting here, I don't know how we get to a balanced budget if we carry on this way. Anyhow, uh, this means that by 2027, 2028, our deficit will still remain somewhere around 14 billion to the negative side, uh, a far cry from being in the black as Krista Freeland had uh, previously told us. Um, and what's their justification for this? Well, ultimately all they've said is, uh, you know, that Canada's debt to GDP ratio is the lowest of the G7 nations. I don't know if that's good news or not, Dan, but it just, you know, it, by comparison, that doesn't necessarily mean we're doing something right or better. It just means it could mean a whole slew of different things. Like on a per capita basis, is this true? I don't know, right? Overall, our numbers are lower, probably because the other G7 nations have bigger economies than ours. Anyhow, the country's overall debt is set to rise to 1.31 trillion over the next five years. With continued high interest rates, the federal government is projected to pay only 43.9 billion next year. This just services Canada's debt, outstanding debt, right? Like we, 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 we're not even getting to the, the principal pay down here. Uh, so 
a bit of a side note to this, Dan, the whole discussion really continues to promote taking on more and more and more debt without a concise way to reduce the increased cost of spending. It's unfortunate, in my opinion, that we continue to see the encouragement of taking on more debt before creating ways of paying for them. Shouldn't it really be the other way around where we create ways to pay for the debt that we currently have that will take us out of this problem instead of continuing to spend and spend and spend and then <laughs> to, to, to quote you, to pretend like we're going to be able to pay it back, right? In my humble opinion, uh, we need a little more fiscal conservatism, fiscal anyhow, uh, in this budget to bring back some sense of balance so that we can pay for all of the spending. I know you were going to cut in there, Dan. Yeah, just a little earlier, I'm just a little bit uh, confused on them kind of blaming a slowing economy for why they have to go into debt. And yet we've seen GDP ever since January of last year above pre-COVID levels and rising. So, I mean, I haven't read the budget. I haven't dissected it, but that one just kind of caught me off guard. Yeah, well, wait till we get into the GDP numbers because <laughs> they're even more bananas. Uh, but Okay. Well, Anyhow. let's let's continue to uh, discuss the infinite wisdom of the Fed. Yes, it's easy to sit here and poke holes, but uh, hey, we're going to do it a little bit anyway here. And because they have just, with without even the foreign ban being in existence for a total of three months, the Fed's already backtracking on some of the rules within it. And this is largely because these were largely poor policies to begin with that were created with no consultation with people within the real estate industry. Uh, the real estate board being a, a licensed agent here, I get to see a, a number of the conver conversations going back and forth here. The board kept reaching out saying, hey, we're here to help. Let's discuss this. And the Fed basically just didn't uh, answer those calls. And now they're realizing, oops, we made some mistakes. So a couple of things that they've decided to backtrack on here. Number one, non-Canadians in the country on a work permit or who are authorized to work in Canada can now purchase a residential property. Uh, one stipulation there, they must have at least 183 days or more remaining on their work permit and are only allowed to purchase one property. Okay, Damn. so why are they doing this? Honestly, they just put, they saw the population grow here by a million plus people last year and then realized, oops, we don't have any housing for them. So you're bringing all these people in to fill some of these 800,000 plus job vacancies we have so they can help grow their GDP and tax the hell out of these people to help pay for their massive debts. And yet they realized they didn't have anywhere that they could live. And rental rates, as we know, are just off of their all time highs. So that didn't work. And I think they've had to back step on that and say, oh, okay, well, if you can afford it, you can buy. A lot of these people here are coming here on their work visa, but they're also working on obtaining their PR, their permanent residency, because they plan to live here. So they're now allowed to buy. Number two, non-Canadians and foreign businesses can now also purchase residential property if, if they tend to develop it and can purchase vacant land zoned for residential or mixed use for any purpose they choose. <laughs> so after banning foreign foreigners, excuse me, uh, because they were the reason that prices went up, um, they also realize that, oops, we're having a serious problem with our, with our housing crisis. Inventories are record low across the nation. So they're letting foreigners now help build housing here. Okay, maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't, but you gotta also think if you're a foreigner and you're like, okay, well, there's a two year ban. It's gonna take 18 months for me just to get my building permit. Well, I can still build and maybe by that time this two years is up, they will have lifted the ban and I can go and move into it anyway, or at least buy it as a foreigner, rent it out, whatever that's to be seen. But let's continue, there's more. The foreign buyer ban no longer applies to vacant land. So non-Canadians can now purchase vacant land zoned for residential use for any purpose. Meaning if you are out of the country and you feel like Canada and the land it is made out of is a solid asset to put your money in, you can do that. <laughs> you can buy vacant <laughs> land zoned for residential use and use it for any purpose. That means you can buy a beautiful lot and just sit on it for 50 years if you want to. Or buy a beautiful lot and build your house. <laughs> so when we're talking about uh, foreigners not being able to, to purchase, what happened here, and I think a big reason why they backtracked on that, is there was a lot of local developers here who raise funds and have a lot of American companies that help finance their projects. 
And so what happened is the, these people were basically told that, hey, you cannot build anymore because, you know, uh, uh, 4% of the money that you've raised is from offshore money or, or non-Canadian funds. And so that means that you're now a foreign entity. Ridiculous as that sounds, this is, again, why the policies didn't work and why they're backtracking. So they've upped that, that threshold. Uh, it is now 10%. So if you are a local developer, you can raise up to 10% of foreign capital to help build your projects. Previously, an entity was deemed foreign uh, if it owned, if, sorry, if non-Canadians funded 3% or more. So now, now that's up to 10%. That may have helped. Regardless, let's take a quick look here. What was the reason that this foreign buyer ban even came into existence? It was to fight rising costs. Well, the ban went into effect on January the 1st this year, and prices are higher today than they were when the ban came into effect. So yeehaw, uh, not, not a surprise, I'm afraid. But uh, here's another federal policy that was um, created without consulting the real estate industry. And it is not only not working, but they're having to redefine it after less than three months in existence. Well, I mean, a couple of things. The number one, you don't consult any industry and then you come in and make sweeping changes to it as if you know better. I mean, that's that would be like me coming into a hospital and making sweeping healthcare changes, knowing nothing about it without consulting the doctors. Too funny. It's, That's the exact, exact same words <laughs> I was going to make. They, they don't go to real estate professionals to discuss how to modify our health care. It's, it's basically as ridiculous and, a thought. And there's a bit of an inconvenient truth when it comes to property development and creating real estate supply. As much as we don't want to allow for speculation to take place, where do you think speculative money goes? Speculative money, speculative money goes into projects because investors are trying to make your return. And in order to provide the housing stock required for the amount of people coming into Canada, we need some speculator money to develop the properties we need. It's a bit of an inconvenient truth. As much as we would like to create all of the property here for all the people who have citizenship here, it's just not a reality, not when the cost of living is where it's at, and not when you have land prices that have shot up 600% in the last 20 years. It's an inconvenient truth. And you can like it or not, but we need the money. That's the truth. And developers rely on money coming from around the world to help build the projects and, and the products for Canadians. So, you know, like it or not, it's, it's an unfortunate truth. So... Uh, and there's some more unfortunate truths about our GDP as well. Um, so Stats Canada released today, uh, today being March 31st, um, that shows the economy actually grew by 0.5% month over month in January. This is a remarkable reversal from December when it actually contracted by 0.1%. So January's reading also beat Bay Street analysis, or sorry, analysts, who estimated growth of 0.4%. So preliminary data suggests that in February as well, that was January, February is also going up by 0.3%. This is some momentum building in our GDP. If it continues on this range, um, we'll likely see our GDP grow by a 2.5% annualized. This is a, that's, that's, significant growth when the Bank of Canada is trying to contract the economy. <laughs> uh, and this is where things get a bit more difficult. So stay with me for a sec. This news now complicates the job for the Bank of Canada. As I've mentioned in a number of pods before this, inflation coming down to the high to mid fours will be relatively easy and done through interest rates. But as we get into the high fours, the mid fours and lower, the job will become significantly more difficult for the Bank of Canada. And this is because in the last two years, the Bank of Canada turned the printers on and blew 33% more into our money supply. It's very difficult now to ever pull all of that back out. So to get back down to the two or 3% target rate that they want is going to be far more difficult than it was uh, before. So it's, we're in a very tight spot and you got to remember, why do we even have this 2% inflation rate? Why do we have this 2% target? Well, when we hit the pandemic, we actually had a place to go 
to create a buzz in the economy. So the 2% is really in case of, you know, a crisis and we can dump the rates and, and continue to, to grind the economy forward. And it's also set there um, so that interest rates offset the inflation rate. So anyhow, um, here's a quote from Douglas Porter. This is the chief economist from BMO, and here's his thoughts. So quote, there were many indications that the economy got off to a solid start in 2023, but today's double-barreled blast of strength is well above even the most optimistic views. Even if growth stalls in March, it now looks like Q1 will post growth of 2.5% up from a flat read in Q4. While we continue to look for a more notable cool down in the next two quarters, we are bumping up our GDP growth estimates for all of 2023 by three ticks to 1%. Suffice it to say, the strength seen in the opening months of the year persists. The Bank of Canada is going to find itself in a very tough spot. So some of the takeaways. There's a lot of uncertainty around whether the Bank of Canada will continue the fight against inflation come April, or will it pursue financial stability? I think it'll likely be the latter because we still haven't experienced enough of what's happened in the last nine, 10 months of rate hikes. I still think we're going to see some of that play out. And like I've said for months now, 2023 mostly will be a bumpy ride, whether that's due to inflation, whether that's due to interest rates, housing supply, you name it, it's going to be bumpy. But the question remains, are we actually seeing growth in our GDP because supply chains are now coming back online? Or are we seeing inflationary pressures resume their previous trend? It's a little hard to say right now. I think only time will tell. But April's announcement when it comes to interest rates will be very telling in terms of what the bank thinks is happening. Very interesting. And also basically defying any chance in the near future of a recession, mm. which by its very definition cannot exist with strong employment and increasing GDP. So Correct. no signs of a recession, really. I mean, I can't say no signs, but diminishing signs. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, economist notes that I read... Uh, they all still are quoting the Bank of Canada saying the Bank of Canada expects a light recession, but we'll see. I mean, they've been really wrong in the last couple of years, whether they predicted up or down, right? So it's hard to know really how this is going to play out. Inflation being transitory will go down in history is one of the biggest uh, blunder quotes of all time, unfortunately. I, yeah. The BOC. I, I mean, inflation by its very nature can't be transitory. And that's a whole other conversation. Inflation by its very nature is... Uh, a rising cost in, in prices. Yes. Yeah. Anyhow. <laughs> okay. So let's wrap up this episode with what has happened here in real estate in the month of March. As Ryan had mentioned here, it is March 31st. So while the official data has not been publicly announced, we get all this information in real time and can kind of give you some insights into what you can expect to hear next week when it is put forward. Sales, first of all, um, off of a very low baseline, but they're jumping up about 40% over February. We're going to see just around or just under 2,600 units sold. That's actually the highest we've seen since May of last year. So there's been an uptick in sales volumes, whereas inventory, on the other hand, is remaining incredibly low. What's the story, inventory? All day long here. Now, this is going to be the fourth month in a row where we're seeing inventory under 9,000 units. And that is incredibly rare. We've only seen this about four times. Once in 2022, um, because of course, that was the peak of all peaks. And then we also saw this in 2016 and 2017. So let's think about that. The only time we've seen similar inventory in the history of GVRD real estate was in three years that had skyrocketing prices. We're seeing similar <laughs> story now and we're, seeing, we're gonna see prices tick up for two months in a row here. Where's this gonna go? Very interesting, we don't know. And here I am rhyming again. But <laughs> something to point out too, when I'm talking about sales are low, check out this little stat. To be in the to be a medallion level agent means that you are in the top 10% of all 15,000 realtors here in Greater Vancouver. In Q1 of 2023, you only had to sell four houses to be considered selling in the top 10% of all 15,000 realtors. That's how slow it is right now. So what's happening with prices? Um, 
After we saw a significant rise in February in both the median and average, well, March is increasing even more. Median prices right now for all, all asset classes, all types of homes in GVRD is up $20,000. Average prices are up $57,000. And if we look to the DTAX segment, it is going parabolic again, where median prices are up $132,000 this month alone in detached homes and average prices for that same property type are up $77,000 just last month. Because of our low inventory, even with low sales, we're gonna see that sales to active listings ratio land somewhere around 26%, making it the second month in a row in a seller's market and also increasing so into that seller's category. Really bizarre what's happening right now. And with this low inventory and with the spring market here and with people feeling a little bit more confident with rates holding, we're seeing activity levels increase dramatically. And I think maybe Ryan will share some stories about how many times we've seen multiple offers just this week alone and the volume of those multiple offers. Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, one little point I'll add to your stat there, Dan, just a reminder for everybody. When we start to see detached either rise up or come down in price, it's typically the leader in asset classes. So if detached homes are starting to go, townhouses will go next, condos will follow, right? That's typically the historic way that this works. So if you own one of those property types and you're, you know, you're not feeling like you've seen a huge bump yet, it's coming. Um, so long as trends continue. And to that point, uh, okay. So Monday, uh, we were uh, offering on a really, really cool um, townhouse here in East Vancouver in, in Knight, uh, neighborhood of Knight. And, um, oh, they had uh, 57 showings on the weekend and they had um, 11 offers and the home was listed for a million uh, 98,000 and it sold for 1.225. So it's, yeah, so it sold well over the list price to the tune of uh, about 10%. Uh, furthermore, then we had a listing on Tuesday. Uh, this property was a, uh, this was a smoking hot deal. This was 449,000 in the downtown core, but it was a 50 year old condo. Uh, and, uh, it sold nine and a half percent over the list price with eight offers and also with uh, plus more than 50 people coming through in one week to view it. 50 groups. Also, yes. Should also mention that. Yeah. 40 in two days. Um, just for some reference there. Um, our colleague Marita, who was on, uh, our podcast, uh, earlier last month, uh, doing a Toronto update for us. I checked in with her yesterday, uh, and she was uh, looking at a um, a row home. I believe it was priced uh, somewhere in in the mid twos, um, and they received twenty eight offers. And I don't know what the property sold for, uh, but she told me that multiple offers are becoming commonplace again in Toronto. Uh, so we're seeing it now in not just our market; we're seeing it in the Toronto market as well. Uh, so I. Yeah. And these aren't even outliers. I mean, you know, no. we had our, our, our colleague who offered it something in Fleetwood, 29 offers. And you talk to almost any agent right now, especially ones who do volume, they're all experiencing it. I mean, look at any Instagram story right now. And uh, chances are it's a realtor talking about multiples and, and how deep it was. I mean, we're talking double digit multiples are here. It was hard to buy a deal four months ago. Now it's hard to buy a house. <laughs> it's just shifted so quickly here. And uh, we're going to likely see, I believe it was last month, um, one in five homes sold over ask. This month, it's going to be at least one in, in four when, when it all washes out here. So it's trending in that manner. And I, last thing I'll say is uh, I was picking up keys to, for a home that we negotiated the price down on in January. And, uh, as I was picking up the keys from the realtor, I said, Hey, you know, how's your day going? She goes, Oh, you know, great. Just lost in multiples again. <laughs> so, and this is, this is in, this is in Tawasan, South Surrey, right? This isn't, uh, the center of the Vancouver market either. So there you go. 
we are set up for a very interesting April. So if you are considering selling or buying, it's a very unique time and, and definitely needs specific conversations about how to best benefit or if it makes sense to wait. Either way, we'd love to chat with you about that. Feel free to reach out to us below. Thanks as always. Have an awesome day. We look forward to connecting again next week.